Plasticity in the adult brain, any age, can be as robust as it is in childhood, as fast and as traumatic, wow. provided the focus is there and it's all contingent on this acetylcholine molecule. If there's a serious contingency, like in order to get your ration of food each day, you have to learn this thing, the degree of plasticity is remarkable. Right. But if there isn't an incentive, it just isn't gonna happen. I think that in terms of value of understanding the nervous system and where it can be steered, it's absolutely clear that the nervous system can change in response to experience. So this thing we call neuroplasticity is really that. It's the brain's ability to modify itself in response to uh -huh. experience. And I think it's important to understand that from birth till about age 25, the brain is extremely malleable in a kind of almost passive way where kids are exposed to things and the brain is just wiring up. I mean, the brain is really designed to adjust itself in order to be in concert with its surroundings and to optimize that just the, the way we described a minute like ago. Like the way that mm -hmm. a child can learn a language very quickly. Or, or three languages. play the guitar or something yeah, like that. Yeah, without an accent. You know, right. three languages without an accent. It's remarkable. You try and do that after age 25, it's very challenging. And so the, the brain is basically designed to be customized in the early part of life and then to implement those algorithms and that circuitry for the rest of its life. And so the brain can change in adulthood and it can change provided that there's an emphasis on some perceptual event. So in other words, if you wanna change your brain as an adult, let's say you wanna be less anxious, you wanna learn a new language, you wanna be more functional in some way, presumably. The key thing is to bring focus to some particular perception of something that's happening during the learning process. And the reason for that is that there's a neurochemical system involving acetylcholine. And it comes from these two little nuclei down in the base of the brain called nucleus basalis. All day long, you're doing things in a reflexive way. But when you do something and you think about it very intensely, acetylcholine is released from basalis at the precise neurons that were involved in that behavior. And it marks those for change mm. during sleep or during deep rest later. So for people that wanna change their brain, the power of focus is really the entry point. And the ability to access deep rest and sleep. Mm. Because most people don't realize this, but neuroplasticity is triggered by intense focus, but neuroplasticity occurs during deep sleep and rest. And we can talk about how to optimize those different brain functions. What the brain really wants to do is also pass as much of what it does off to reflexive behavior as possible. Uh -huh. so, <laughs> yeah. so when we're talking about focus, I think it can get a little bit vague but it might be useful to think about like what exactly is focus and what triggers plasticity. So the brain loves to be able to just do things, pick up coffee cups and drink and walk and talk and do things and not put much energy into it. When we decide to focus, what the brain really does is it switches on a set of circuits that involve the frontal cortex and nucleus basalis and some others. And it's trying to understand duration, how long something's gonna last, path, what's gonna happen, and outcome, what ultimately is gonna happen. So duration, path, and outcome. If it's a simple example, like trying to learn a new language or a new motor skill or a new way of conceptualizing something, maybe somebody's in a therapeutic process and they're trying to work through a trauma or something like that, duration, path, and outcome is built into the network. So the brain, we can do that very easily, but it takes work. And it almost has a feeling of underlying agitation and frustration. And that's because the circuits that turn on before acetylcholine are of the stress system. So when you or I decide we're gonna learn something and really dig in, norepinephrine, which is adrenaline, is secreted in the brainstem and in the body, and it brings about a state of alertness. Then our attention, which is mostly a diffuse light, is brought to a particular duration path and outcome analysis. This would be thinking about what somebody is saying. What are they really trying to say? A hard passage of reading, a hard you know, set of math problems, a challenging physical workout. When you do that, these two systems have to work very hard and the adult brain doesn't really wanna change the algorithms it learned in childhood. But if you do those two things, you have alertness and focus, the acetylcholine and the norepinephrine converge to mark those synapses for change. Mm. So the way to think about neuroplasticity if one wants to change their brain is bring about the most intense concentration you can to something, and then later bring about the least amount of concentration to that thing. So I'll, I'll talk about that in a second, but there were some studies that were done at Stanford by a guy named Eric Knudsen that showed that plasticity in the adult brain, any age, 
can be as robust as it is in childhood, as fast and as dramatic, wow. provided the focus is there and it's all contingent on this acetylcholine molecule coming from nucleus basalis. So you say, well, how do you do that? How do you, right, how yeah. do you get it? You know? <laughs> exactly. Well, I've got friends that chew Nicorette thinking that's gonna get them there because Nicorette is a nicotinic acetylcholine agonist, but that's gonna globally increase acetylcholine. So I always tell them that's not the right approach. The right approach is to bring as much focus to a behavior or to a thought or to an action pattern. And there has to be a sense of urgency. So what Newton lab showed and is that if there's a serious contingency, like in order to get your ration of food each day, you have to learn this thing, the degree of plasticity is remarkable. Right. But if there isn't an incentive, it just isn't gonna happen. So these circuits in the brain that mother nature set up are designed to be anchored to a real need. And people always say to me, well, should I do something out of love and a real desire to learn or should it be out of fear? but either one works. The sense of urgency is just acetylcholine. Mm -hmm. It's norepinephrine, that's all it is. It doesn't, the brain doesn't have a recognition of whether or not something is pleasurable or not until later. Once you start accomplishing your goal, the reward systems like dopamine start kicking in. But I think if people are interested in modifying their brain for the better, at least some you know, top contour understanding of how urgency and focus must converge for that to happen mm. can be useful because I think there's a lot of attention paid to whether or not something feels like flow or whether or not it's the, what I call highly desirable states right. or whether or not you can, you can eat a plant out of the ground that will magically put your brain into a state of plasticity. Right. And the answer is yes, <laughs> such plants exist, uh -huh. but what's missing is the focus component. If that work is not done with a particular end goal in mind, you'll get plasticity, but you'll get plasticity in a kind of across the board. It's like learning nine lang learning a little bit of nine languages all at once is not gonna make you speak coherently in any one of them. So focus is the key. Right, I mean, this idea of flow is so much in the vernacular now. And you know, my, my sense is that people are trying to measure their level of engagement against some sort of theoretical idea of what it's like to be in that flow state. And if they're not experiencing it, they feel like they're doing it wrong or, they're, or they're, they, they feel guilty or they beat themselves up. And for me, it's a lot of it is just hard work. We don't really understand flow. Mm -hmm. now, people have come up with these theories. It's like you know, hypo, hyperfrontality. I, I, I haven't seen the, the data and I'm not picking on anybody. I'm, I'm putting that out there as a prompt for people to discover this. I think that, and to work on it. I think it's a really interesting, highly desirable state, but I think we need to get comfortable as a, as a culture in trying to understand our species and how we work that the early stages of hard work and focus are gonna feel like agitation, stress, and confusion because that's the norepinephrine and adrenaline system kicking in. None of us would expect to walk into the gym and do our PR lift or you know, a performer go do something without warming up. The brain also needs to warm up and start to hone in which circuits are gonna be active. And it's, it's unreasonable for us to think, oh, I've got an hour, I'm gonna plop down and write mm. beautifully for an hour, my best work. We need to accept that there's a period of agitation and stress that accompanies the dropping into these highly concentrated states. 